Good morning. Good to see everybody today. It's a great day to come worship the Lord, and we're glad you're here with us to do that. If you have not gotten a communion cup, please raise your hand, and Eric will get one to you uh, for a communion in a few minutes. Got one over here. And if you are a guest today, we're extremely happy you're with us today. If you would, please fill out a guest card and just leave it on the pew. As you leave today, we'd like to send you a thank you note and keep you apprised of the activities here. Obviously, we're a little spaced today. We're still on our social distancing and uh, probably be that for that way on the for foreseeable future. As we begin today, let's go to our Father in prayer. Most holy and righteous Father, we approach your throne today in joy as we come to lift up your name and worship you. Father, we're so thankful that we have this avenue that we can come and speak to you and that we can lift our voices in praise to you. Thank you for this opportunity we have. We pray, Father, that everything we do today will be pleasing to you and will be uplifting to each one of us. Help us now, Father, as we worship you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all sing together. There's something about that name. There's something about that name. Good morning. You know how when I tell, I used to tell, I usually tell y'all, y'all give me your favorite songs and I'll sing them. Today's Edwin Day. So <clears throat> there's going to be a couple of unfamiliar ones. So we, we should know all of them. We should have seen all of them. But it's, it's Edwin Day. And they don't have anything to do with the lesson. They don't necessarily have anything to do with one another. But they have a lot to do with praise. Uh, I was down here yesterday getting them together and singing in the foyer. And if you ever want to hear something great, come sing in the foyer if you can sing. Because it just bounces off those walls. I exalt thee. So, for thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. Oh Lord, I exalt thee. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. Oh Lord, for Thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. For Thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. I exalt thee, I exalt thee, I exalt thee, O Lord, 
I exalt Thee, I exalt Thee, I exalt Thee, O Lord, I exalt Thee, I exalt Thee, I exalt Thee, O Lord, I exalt Thee, I exalt Thee, I exalt Thee, O Lord. <clears throat> Precious Lord, take my hand. So be when my way groweth cheer, precious Lord, linger near when my life is all most gone. Near my cry, near my call, hold my hand, lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn through the storm. Through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When the shadows appear and the night draweth near and the day is past and gone at the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand, take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home, precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on. To the light, take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home.
We could almost just read that song and have a beautiful prayer to God. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Our Holy Father, we recognize you as the only true and living God, the creator of all that there is, and with all the blessings that we receive are from thy bountiful hand, and we're grateful for them, especially for your love and your grace and your mercy that you shower upon us each and every day. We're grateful for Jesus, for his love for you and his love for mankind, and his willingness to go to that cross and be crucified so that his redeeming blood could pay for our sins and lead us back to have a hope of eternity with you. We're also grateful for the Holy Spirit that you allowed to guide us in the pathway of righteousness. May we take his words and his leadership and walk that pathway each and every day of our life. We're grateful for the group that meets here, Lord. We're thankful for the shepherds that shepherd this flock, that feed and protect it. We ask for your wisdom and guidance in all that they do here that will be in accordance with your will. We're thankful, Lord, for the members, and we pray that those that are having troubles and issues and trials and tribulations, that uh, you would help them with that, that we would be aware of that and try to give them words of encouragement as we have opportunity. Unfortunately, dear Lord, we, we, we sin. We don't do the things that we want to do, and we do the things that we don't want to do from time to time. And we ask forgiveness of those sins. We ask for your strength and encouragement to be able to turn from those things which sometimes appeal to us and walk away from them and do the right thing and trust in you. You're our Savior. You're our hope. And we're thankful for that. We ask that you be with us during this service, that you would be with those who are unable to be here, especially those that are sick. We would pray for them, but more importantly, those that are not here because of indifference. We know these are very difficult times where we can't all meet together. We pray that everybody is doing all that they can to get the spiritual growth and nourishment that they need. Be with us through this service. In Christ's name, amen. There's something about that name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. 
Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I want to make sure in preparation for the Lord's Supper, everyone does have a cup as we begin. And also with that, if you have your Bible with you, you can turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 2. That is our focus scripture, verses 14 and 15. Carl made a very valid point when he said in his prayer that uh, we could repeat that song and that would suffice as a prayer. But also at the same time, I think that uh, as we gather around this memorial and what we're soon to do, those same words could be echoed by me, that the words of that song certainly are very foot, uh, fitting for this time and what we're to do. But taking a look at that passage that we are to consider, and as I begin, I want you to realize that uh, in thinking about and being uh, preparing to say some thoughts. You know, death, uh, death is a hard thing because we enjoy so much what we do in this life. The blessings that are showered by God, this church family, our own families, and the things that we enjoy are just wonderful blessings that he gives us. But you know, death is 100%. There is not anybody that has passed through life without dying, save a couple of characters in the Bible, but I'm talking about those of us. And so death was something that a lot are, are frightened about and worry about. But this passage of Scripture, and if you look there with me at the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, and I will share that with you. Since then the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, talking about Jesus Christ, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power over death, that is, the devil. And he might deliver those who, through fear of death, were subject to slavery all their lives. A lot of people go through life, get to a point where the end of that life frightens them. Should not be such with a Christian. And in this memorial instituted by Jesus Christ, it is something this inspired writer tells us that we have been subject to that, slaves of that all our lives, till we found Christ and obeyed him. And we go back and remember this memorial. And he takes away that fear of death because we know, as we have read and as we've studied and as we've obeyed, that this memorial was done specifically for us to remember his death, his burial, his resurrection, and a day would come. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 16, uh, excuse me, verse 24, he told us the things to do as we remember this. And he told us, and that's what we'll do at this time, is remember the body. He said there in 24, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. So if you can peel back that first layer, we'll take a moment for us to do that. So let's bow together as we partake of the bread. Our God and Father, we are truly thankful for this memorial that you instituted. And as we have read in Hebrews about the taking away of the fear of death, we're so thankful that you sent your son. We are truly a blessed people to have that confidence and that great faith in the fact that he died for me. And this bread is done as a memorial which was broken for us, for us to remember him in that way. Thank you again for that great sacrifice is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Continuing on in the reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So let's bow together. Father, we thank you so much in remembering our Lord and Savior. Savior, our Master. We thank you for the blood that was shed for us. We're so thankful for the shedding of blood that, blood that gave us such wonderful freedoms, freedom from sin, freedom from death at the end of our life. And we thank you for that great sacrifice. We're praying, Father, that we will be glorifying you and your Son, Jesus, as we partake of this fruit of the vine remembering him always as we long for his reappearing. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus rose with all power in his hands. Jesus rose with all power in his hands. He died on Friday evening, rose on Sunday morning. Jesus rose with all power in his hands, in his hands. Early one Sunday morning, just before the break of day, early one Sunday morning, just before the break of day, early one Sunday morning, just before the break of day, Jesus rose with all power in his hands, in his hands. Jesus rose with all power in his hands. Jesus rose with all power in his hands. He died on Friday evening rose on Sunday morning. Jesus rose with all power in his hands, in his hands. Angel came down from glory, rolled the stone away. Angel came down from glory, rolled the stone away. Angel came down from glory, 
Roll the stone away. Jesus rose with all power in his hands, in his hands. Jesus rose with all power in his hands. Jesus rose with all power in his hands. He died on Friday evening. Rose on Sunday morning, Jesus rose with all power, Jesus rose with all power, Jesus rose with all power in his hands, in his hands. We're at a place in our worship service where we have the opportunity just to reflect on, first of all, the blessings that God has given us. And then I want you to just think, if you would, in your own mind about the opportunity God gave his people all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, the opportunity to return to him some sort of contribution that they were asked to make. And please notice with me that the Word of God talks about a lot of different things. Using your time, using your talent, using your abilities, using your monies, whatever it might be to contribute. To be able to help the Lord's cause because the prospect of spreading the good news, the gospel throughout the world, falls on each and every Christian and every person. I know that you follow up and we try to make it accessible as possible to you about the amount of good men that we are supporting in other places. We put their reports over here down this hallway on the back wall and there's some material that you might want to read about the work they do. I know the shepherds here check on that on a regular basis. Like everything else, we're kind of shut away from being able to actually go put our hand on it right now. But we do keep up with that, so I want you to know that, so and think about that. I want to praise you for a minute in your contribution, because of the praise that needs to go forth is the amount of you that are taking the time to look in on your brother and sister in Christ and share good wishes, good food, and little things that you are doing to make their life while they are quarantined a little more normal. You, so many of you provide meals for so many different people. There have been not a lot of big gatherings where we've been able to do all that together, but you individually have done a great job. Please keep that up. Do it for the glory of God. And when we contribute, that's what it needs to be, do, what we need to be doing for the glory of God. And we thank you for that, or I thank you for that. And we know that is a responsibility we need to fulfill. In the back as you leave, you will notice the boxes, and they're provided for your convenience. We also have an online contribution place, give a fly, and that you're allowed to uh, go on there and do, uh, you know, through computer, contrib contribute that way, but uh, whatever it is that you can do, please continue to do what you have been doing. It is just so beneficial to the work of the Lord here. Let's bow together in prayer. Our God and Father, we are uh, truly a blessed people. We uh, have had a couple of those blessings taken away from us these fat past few months. The blessing of convenience, the blessing of family group hug, and being together a little more closely than we are right now and we recognize that is something we miss but you have just showered us with so many great blessings you have made us a very talented loving family and we appreciate that and we pray father that as we return whatever we can to you that will do so in the proper manner doing it in a manner that will glorify you and the work of the Lord will go on. And the monies that we give, the time we spend, the talent we share 
We thank you so much for the blessing of being able to do those things. Continue to keep us healthy and safe. And Father, be with us as we continue on in this worship. This day is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Before Jody <clears throat> brings us the word, please stand. We'll sing, uh, I am a poor wayfaring stranger. <clears throat> I am a poor wayfaring stranger while traveling through this world of woe. Yet there's no sickness, toll, nor danger in that bright land to which I go. I'm going there to see my Father. I'm going there no more to roam. I'm only going over Jordan. I'm only going over home. I know dark clouds will gather round me. I know my way is rough and steep, but golden fields lie out before me, where God's redeemed shall ever sleep. I'm going there to see the saved ones who've passed before me one by one. I'm only going over Jordan. I'm only going over home. I'll soon be free from every trial. My body lay in the churchyard. I'll drop the cross of self-denial and enter on my great reward. I'm going there to see my Savior, to sing His praise forevermore. I'm only going over Jordan. I'm only going over home. Brother Jody. Well, good morning, and good morning to those of you who are joining us live on uh, Facebook or YouTube this morning. We're very glad you've joined us as well. You know, I, I want to begin by saying this morning, and Wayne alluded to it um, in some of his comments as well, that we are certainly living in a time of confusion and misunderstanding about a lot of things. And I am confident that it being an election season does not help that at all. Um, we live daily with this sense of unknown because of the virus, because of uh, uh, problems that seem to be existing in places that, that seem to be ramped up to worse than they were before. Uh, and it just seems like ever-changing news. We, we almost don't know what to hear, what to believe, what to see. I was reminded recently about uh, the prophet Habakkuk back in the Old Testament because Habakkuk cried out to God about the situation that they were in. And uh, in chapter 1, I think it's about verse 5, 
that he asks God, he cries out to God, in essence saying, I don't, I don't understand what's going on. Don't, don't you see all of this evil? Don't you see all of this bad? Don't you see all of these trials and all these problems around us? And uh, why aren't you doing anything? In essence, is what he cries out to God and asks. And God says to him, I am working a work in your day, which if I told you, you wouldn't believe it. And Habakkuk presses God further for an answer. And, and he wants to know. And so God says, well, I tell you what, I, here's what I'm going to do. I'm raising up the Chaldean nation, that ultra-hateful, harsh, bitter and violent nation, and they're going to come and fight against you, and they're going to destroy Israel. And Habakkuk cries out in essence and says, wait a minute, I don't understand <laughs> the very thing God told him. How can you use this? How can you use this bitter, hasty nation, the Chaldeans, to do this? And what I, what I want to say to you from this this morning is just simply this, that that maybe God is sparing us by us not knowing what's, what's around the bend. Um, I, I'm not portending worse things or better things. I'm just saying maybe God is sparing us. Because here's one thing that I do know. God still rules this world. And even though we don't know sometimes what's going on, even though we don't understand what's, what's happening, I still know that God rules this world. And that's something for us to hold on to and to be buoyed up by. So let me just, let me change subjects now. I just wanted to say that. Uh, I want to talk about an incident that's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke of the New Testament. It's a very interesting incident. We're going to be looking at Mark's account of this. But Jesus tells the story or the gospel writers tell the story about a man who was paralyzed and who, <clears throat> who is healed by Jesus. And I want you to try to imagine, before we get into the text itself, I want you to try to think with me, try to imagine with me what it would be like to be a person who is paralyzed in the first century. This man's world was essentially confined to a mat three foot by six foot. That was essentially it. Not very far he could go. There were no social service programs in his day to reach out and to help somebody in his condition. There were no special treatment centers. There were no rehabilitation facilities designed to help somebody in his situation. There were no handicapped parking spots. There were no motorized wheelchairs for him. To be moved, he had to be carried by others. When he soiled himself, he had to be cleaned up by others. He may have had to be uh, helped to eat or to dress himself, depending on to what degree his paralysis was. His only means of provision, at least for many of those people in that time, was the generosity of other people. And so, often would be the case of somebody in his condition, that he would be carried down to a busy street corner where people would pass by, and the best that he could hope for would be the generosity of somebody or someone's handing him a few coins, putting a few coins in his cup. And tomorrow, he had the same thing all over again. There was no money, no job, apparently no future. But I do want to tell you something that this man had. We're going to be looking in Mark chapter 2, verse 1, beginning. This man had a group of friends because he was part of a small group of friends who took care of him. I want you to read with me beginning in verse 1 of Mark chapter 2. And again it says, he, that is Jesus, entered Capernaum after some days and it was heard that he was in the house Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer any room to receive them, not even at the door. And he, Jesus, preached the word to them, and they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. 
And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. I want you to know that this was an intentional group. This was an intentional group of people. This did not happen by accident. These four friends make a monumental, special effort for their friend. Now, this begs the question, was he paralyzed early in life and they had developed this friendship over time and, and they had always known him as a paralytic? Um, or had this happened later in his life? Had, had he been a young and healthy man and had befriended these other guys and they had hung out together and they had done things together and they had worked together or gone places together and then some accident or some illness befalls him and now he's paralyzed? I don't know. The text doesn't tell us. But it does say to me, regardless of the situation... Whether it was long term or this was recent, they stayed around regardless of the situation, which is not always an easy thing to do. Our middle son, Ryan, <clears throat> got his undergraduate degree in speech pathology at University of Central Florida. And one of the assignments that they had, and I think I've mentioned this at one time before, but one of the assignments that they had for that class was to go to a busy mall on a busy day. And they were to go into a store and they were to replicate as best they could a severe speech impediment, either a severe stutter or a very slow, laborious kind of effort to get the word out. And to ask somebody for help or to wait and see how somebody would treat them. And Ryan told us that the, the incident was absolutely, absolutely shocking to them of how many people would come over and they would ask. And when, you would, when they would have such a difficult time to get the word out or whatever, that people just finally just walk away from them and leave them and, and just left them to be on their own. They weren't going to put forth that much effort. We had a friend when we lived in Lakeland, came to church with us a number of times over the course of several months. Um, he had lost his ability to speak, and so he had created, as he knew this was happening to him, he created a, a, on his motorized wheelchair a tablet in front of him that was about uh, approximately two feet wide and 18 to 20 inches tall that had the alphabet on it and had numbers on it and certain key words. And he always hung out at the mall. And what he did was he would go to the stores, and, and when these small stores that they couldn't take a break, he would go down to Chick-fil-A or whatever and get them a drink or sandwich and, and come back and bring it to them. And we'd see him in the mall, and, and you'd say, so how are you doing? And, and it would take five to ten minutes to have what we would think would be a normal 15, 20 second interlude with someone. And it was a challenge. It was a hard thing to do to be able to, to listen and, and not talk for him to go through this. Here was this man. He was paralyzed. There wasn't much he could do for himself. And these four friends, as we just read in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 2, they hatch a plan. You see, they, they thought about their friend when they heard that Jesus was in town. This small group of friends, they heard that Jesus was in town. They knew the stories that were told about Jesus. So they thought about their friend. So they didn't just think about him and say, wow, wouldn't that be nice if we could get him? But they go to their friend. They make the effort to go there. Then they go and they find their friend and they, they carry him while he is on his mat. This begs the question as well, how far did they carry him? Did they carry him 100 yards? Did they carry him a half a mile? Did they carry him all the way across town and maybe it was several miles? I don't know, but that's not an easy task to do this. So they get to the house and they, they want something grand to happen for their friend. Maybe Jesus can do something for him. And so they get to the house and they try and they try and they try to get into the house and they can't, they can't even get near the door of the house. 
but they won't be deterred because these good friends in this small group decide that they're going to stick with it. And so they hatch a daring plan. I don't read often about, in fact, this is the only occasion I read about in the Bible. It's the only occasion that I know of, of a roof-breaking-up party. Um, so who came up with this plan? I suggest it was one of the four friends. It was probably the guy that had all the tattoos that came up with the plan. Maybe a piercing. I, I don't know. But he came up with a plan. Th this is what we're going to do. And so they climb up on top of the roof of the house and they lift the man up to them. Do you know how hard that is to do that? And they get the man up on top of the roof now. And then they break up the roof. And then they lower their friend down in front of Jesus. All of these amazing things that this man had, although he didn't have strength in his legs, although he didn't have much to his name apparently. I want you to know that this kind of friendship, this kind of special bond within a small group doesn't happen by accident. It takes time and it takes effort because you can't microwave friendship, not like this. You can't listen in a hurry. You can't care deeply in a hurry. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes intentionality. You can't build these kinds of bonds in just the, the openness of everybody. This was a small group who get together for this benefit. Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, their faith, that is the four men who carried him, not the man on the mat's faith, when, they, when he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. I'm impressed by that. First of all, that Jesus addresses the most important need first, his spiritual condition. Son, your sins are forgiven you. But that caused a reaction. Some of the scribes who were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts said, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? I want you to know that we don't read anything in the text about these scribes bringing their friends to Jesus. These scribes and these other ones that came and listened to Jesus merely came just to find fault. They wanted to find something they could poke holes in that Jesus said or Jesus does. So when Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven, they immediately said, wait, 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 you can't do that. He said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk? Now, Jesus doesn't mean which words are easier to formulate and to say and to speak. He means which one is easier to do. Is it easier to heal a man who is a paralyzed man, or is it easier to forgive his sins? Which one is easier? But that you may know, verse 10, that the Son of Man, a favorite name Jesus had for himself, that the Son of Man has power on the earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Jesus addresses those who question his authority and says, I can do that because I can do this. I can forgive sins because I am God. I am able to forgive sins because I am God. And I can show you that I am God. Son, get up and walk and go home. And verse 12 says, Immediately he arose, took up his bed, went out in the presence of them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God and said, We have never seen anything like this before. Here's an interesting note. I don't know if you ever thought about this. You know, when they first came and they brought the man to Jesus, they tried to come in the door, they tried to come in, they tried to go here, 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 they couldn't, couldn't get anywhere. So, so they lower him down through the, through the roof. Jesus heals the man, says, okay, rise up, take up, take up your mat, take up your bed, and go home. And it says that he got up immediately, and he walked out from the middle. How did he do that? How did he get out when he couldn't get in? You know how that was? 
is because when this happens, everybody just backs off. I mean, we're going to give this man space. He's going to have room to be able to get out. And they were amazed. And they were shocked that Jesus was able to do what he just did. All right, so here's the point I want to leave with you today. We all have our mats. This man's mat was about three foot by six foot as far as we can tell. He was confined to that mat because of physical paralysis. But we all have our mats that we deal with. We all must deal with mats. Well, now, maybe your mat is a spiritual paralysis that sets upon you because of alcohol or drug or porn, uh, pornography addiction. Maybe your mat is out of control anger. Maybe your mat is a loose tongue and you can't keep your tongue or you don't feel like you can keep your tongue. Whatever your mat is, maybe you say, well, that's not mine. Maybe it's pride. Maybe, maybe the mat that you deal with is a deep, dark secret of some wrong that was done in your past and you just feel paralyzed you feel held by that and you can't change that you feel like what is your mat we all have mats we all have to deal with it. is it laziness is it pettiness is it a griping tongue is it a gossiping tongue what is it what is your mat and since we all have mats, I want to suggest to you that we all need a small group. We all need a small group that's able to help us like these four friends helped this man. That small group that came to his rescue. You know, small groups that we have established here are all about growing these kinds of relationships. These small groups are about developing family connections. And about building bonds and strengthening relationships when we come together. But because when we first rolled this out several years ago, there were some objections to this, some concerns that people, people had voiced that we were doing these small groups. That, that as a rule, we, we almost kind of shied away. We kind of stepped back almost from the idea of presenting them as to what they are and the benefit of these small groups. So I want to change that today. I want to tell you that, that we shouldn't have done that. And what I want to suggest to you today is that the small groups that we engage in and that we're getting ready to start next week, that there are some huge benefits that come from them. And the largest benefit is what I'm just talking about right now. In that we all have our mats and we all have our challenges and we all have our difficulties and what a small group does, when we get together in a small group and we begin to build these kind of relationships with one another, it's where I feel like now I, I, I can maybe open up a little bit more. Maybe you can share with me something that will be helpful to me or I can share something that might be helpful for you. And so we need to have these small groups. Let me suggest to you three things. First of all, and this is a primary question that came are they biblical is it biblical for us to meet in small groups like we're doing let me invite you to turn to acts chapter 2 acts chapter 2 most bible students understand that this is the beginning of the church when the church of our lord had its very inception acts chapter 2 this is the first pentecost after jesus has been resurrected that his power would come upon the apostles and that they would stand and preach, and they do in Acts chapter 2. Beginning at verse 40, and with many other words, he, that is Peter, we have his recorded words here, testified and exhorted them and said, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received the word were baptized on that day, about 3,000 souls and were added to them. So the church has its inception and on the first day, the first gospel message that goes out, 3,000 people. Now we say, wow, that's an enormous number. But there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in Jerusalem. It is a big number. But still the majority did not follow along. 
And it says they continued, verse 42, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and they had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among them as anyone had need. So continuing daily in one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to them daily such as were being saved. The original church in Acts chapter 2 met house to house. They had smaller groups. You can't fit 3,000 people in one of those homes. They met together. It's a biblical precedence for Christians to get together in a group and study whether it's my home, your home, or somebody else's home. The second thing I want to suggest to you is that small groups are needed. And I would say it's especially so in our culture today that is so distant and divided, and especially even more so because of the quarantines and the self-pulling away of COVID-19. Before this virus, this congregation had about 350 to 400 people that would assemble on any given Sunday. Small groups supply what a large gathering cannot supply. That intimacy, that connection, that building of bonds and friendship in such a way that others are not able to do. You know, we've had to kind of learn how to re, we've kind of had to relearn how to do church as a result of this COVID-19. There was one Sunday we didn't meet at all back in March when it just finally came, the immediate shutdown. We didn't know what to do. We didn't have anything online. By the next week, we were up and we had classes and we had worship that we were trying to present online and several weeks before we were able to come back together in any form whatsoever. We had to kind of relearn. How do you do this? How, How do we do it in this culture, in this time, in this moment? We've stumbled and fumbled our way along to some degree. I knew zero about any of that and how to put it online when this started. But we've kind of come along some. We have two gatherings now. We typically will have about 100 to 105 at each of these two assemblies, 9 o'clock and 1030. We have a good number that watch online who join us that way. And truthfully, there's a percentage of people that we don't have any idea if they're doing anything at all. We've tried to check and tried to reach out, but really we don't know. And we fear that there are some doing nothing at all. But the idea of the small groups was designed to build this kind of connectedness and friendship in a way that the large gathering can't. And I just want to say, the notion that gathering for worship at the building at the hallowed hour of 6 p.m. on Sunday night, that that is in any way more spiritual than small groups meeting in a home is just completely without any foundation at all. Third thing that I want to suggest to you as to why we need small groups is because they work. No matter what measurement tool we use, if we talk about attendance, When we talk about attendance on small groups, our attendance increases between 25 and 50% over what is our traditional Sunday evening attendance. If we talk about participation, we normally have, before COVID, we normally have 8 to 10 host homes and 8 to 10 facilitators who are leading sometimes different men than the host of the place itself. If we're talking about evangelism, the intimate small gatherings oftentimes in homes are more conducive to receiving and accepting an invitation and trying to reach out to somebody. A great example of a small group and a small group working that has worked here for years and years is the Thursday morning class. It's a gathering that has gone on for years. There is a special interest a special focus among those who gather and are a part of that group. They care about each other. They're concerned about each other. They check on each other. There is a special intimacy about that group that has been there for years and years. Now, by some standards, it's not truly a small group. 
in that the numbers used to be up around 35 to 40 or so. Now the numbers are down because of the, uh, usually the participants in the class are in the age group of those who are most concerned about their health, and many are having to shelter and stay away. But the Thursday morning small group, or the Thursday morning group that meets, has been a successful small group for years. And that's what this is, just in a different way. So, beginning next week, let me just share with you, as many of you know, that we're going to begin small groups. And because of COVID-19, we're going to have to do them differently. We're not going to meet in homes. Uh, We started to and said we would be willing to host, or this one would be, but some were fearful. So we're going to have small groups that will take place here at the building. We've got two at 12.30, the auditorium. Matt Harrison will be conducting that beginning next week in here. Uh, I presume they'll be back in this corner or something to that effect. Uh, Or maybe not because the high school class is going to be one for the other. Uh, And Jared Ganey will be doing that. 12.45 back in A1. At 2 o'clock there'll be a Zoom class. Uh, If you need the credentials on that, talk to Eric or go look at the form out there in the foyer. At 4 o'clock, there'll be an auditorium gathering as well. Matt Lynch will do. And then at 6 o'clock, there'll be one here that Edwin will take care of. And there's also, I want you to know, uh, Kaylee Lynch has done a great effort for us and put together a kid's packet for your children that will go along with this as well if you want your children to engage in this same study. It's going to be on the subject of prayer. And I know this for a fact. Every one of us could use help with our prayers. And we're going to talk about prayer for five weeks. I'm going to preach on prayer in the morning, and then the class itself will be a further development and enhancing of the lesson itself. So here's what I want to encourage you to do. If, you, <clears throat> if you've not done this before, if you've not joined us for the small groups, <clears throat> I want to encourage you to give at a try for five weeks. I want you to join us at one of these classes. If you're not blessed and you're not benefited by it, then go back and do whatever you were doing before. That certainly is your choice. But I just want to encourage you, don't just throw out the idea, but to join us. We'll be studying prayer and it will be helpful for all of us, I am convinced. So thank you for listening today. I want you to be a part of a small group. That should be obvious. There are sign-up sheets out in the foyer for you to sign up for these groups. If we need more groups, Josh has said, we'll conduct more. Uh, So go out there and look. If you haven't signed up, sign up, please. Or you can go online, find it on our Facebook page, and there's a form that you can go to uh, and do it that way. But let us know how we could help you in that regard. Now, if you're not a Christian... It'd be a thrill for us today to help lead you to Christ or to help usher you into the kingdom of Christ. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, we'd love to baptize you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. If you're willing to change and to come back to Him, let us know how we could serve you in doing that. If you are a Christian and you've walked away from God or you've wandered away from God or you're dealing with something that's just so big that you You want to let us know and want us to pray for you and with you? Let us know how we could serve you in that regard. While together we stand and sing, if you come to the front. Oh, Father, I do sin, and my heart breaks deep within. For you have sought me, yet I turn away from all your Loving care, so often do I fall, yet you reach out again, lifting my burden that is more than I can ever bear. Through your beloved Son, there is grace so undeserved. How can I ever 
sin against the one who makes my heart to sing. Create an heart so clean that like you I may be as light of morning rises up with healing in its wings. My broken contrite heart is so worthless in my sight, but you restore it, give it peace and joy to love and follow you. Oh, may I ever strive to live pure in your sight, filled with your goodness, free to glorify and honor you. Thank you, Jody, for that fine message. And once again, we thank all of you for being here today. And we hope you have an opportunity. Please come back and be with us any chance you might have. If you have not already got an announcement sheet, please pick up one of those before you leave today. It has most of the announcements. I do have a few things to add to that. Uh, first of all, Brother Jack Clark is here today. We're glad to see him. He's had a fight with that uh, virus the past few weeks and uh, is doing much better. So good to see you, brother. Uh, brother uh, or sister uh, Joe Renicky fell Friday, and uh, she's recovering at home now. And uh, Deanna, Deanna Bonnell's mother, Corin Eccles, had a heart attack Friday night. She had uh, treatment and uh, may be coming home today, tomorrow. Okay, coming home tomorrow. So we're thankful for that and continue to remember her in your prayers. Also remember Brother Jennings Norton will be having surgery this week, Wednesday, Wednesday morning. So uh, remember that. One other thing, most of you here know Brother Gary Earhart. Uh, he's the one who used to sit right over here with a mask on every Sunday morning when he was here. For over five years, he suffered with cancer. He is gradually going downhill. But uh, in fact, he hasn't been here going on two years, hasn't been with us for going on two years. His birthday is next month, the 16th. And it's been requested that we shower him with birthday cards. So we'll be reminding you of that. But uh, if you will, mark October 16th, October 16th for Gary on your calendar. And we'll be, as I say, reminding you of that. As Wayne said, do what you can for each other this week. Uh, cars, call, uh, calls, cards, uh, just a, maybe a front door hello for those of you who haven't seen in a long time here. All those will go a long way. But do what you can for others. Brother? One last song. One phone on the floor. <clears throat> Sorry about that. One last song, to him who sits on the throne. Mm, so, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Be praise and honor and glory and power to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever, forever and ever, forever and ever, forever and ever, forever and ever. To him who sits
sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Be praise and honor and glory and power to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever, forever and ever, forever and ever, forever and ever, forever and ever. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we are very thankful and grateful for the opportunity to be here this morning in this period of worship. Father, we are so blessed in this nation, even though we're having tough times right now. We thank you for all your blessings, and we thank you for what you do for us day by day. Thank you for Jody's lesson. And may we all make plans for our small groups. And it will be successful as it has many times in the past. We pray for those who were mentioned needing our prayers. And we thank you for those that have been restored and have re returned to our group. Go with us as we separate. Be with us throughout the week. And maybe we all keep safe. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>